gives me great pleasure to welcome up our first uh, panel this morning. Um, and so without further ado, if I could call to the stage Nigel Frud, CEO of Sonpo International, Paul Brand, Deputy CEO of Convex Insurance, John Berger, CEO of Ascot Reinsurance, and Greg Hendricks, CEO of AXA XL. gentlemen, thanks uh, for making the time. Um, as usual in Bermuda, things uh, start a bit slowly with, uh, with the weather, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make a start. Um, and, and perhaps just to, to start things off, I wondered whether each of you could spend a few moments talking about how your own organizations um, are, are positioning themselves for uh, growth uh, and, and the future. Uh, John, it's most convenient probably to start with you. Sure, well, at, at the ASCOT group, uh, you know, the, the, the flagship part of the ASCOT group is, is a Lloyd Syndicate, started about 20 years ago, joint venture between management and AIG. Three years ago, AIG sold ASCOT to uh, Canadian Canada Public Pension Insurance Board. And the vision was, you know, Lloyd's is a great market, you have to be there, but you want to be in other places too. So since in three years, we've started the Bermuda Reinsurance Company. Uh, we have a U.S. Uh, growing enterprise that's admitted, non-admitted, and an MGA platform. And so when you look at ASCOT, we've got the, the Lloyd Syndicate, the Bermuda Insurance Reinsurance Company, and uh, the, the United States admitted, non-admitted, and an MGA platform. So we have every, every lever, every tool uh, that you can have, uh, absent ILS, we're not an ILS base, but absent that, every tool that you can, you can have uh, in the marketplace. Nigel. Well, part of the question is growth. And the big question in my mind is, what do we mean by growth? What are we trying to do here? Um, in the world that we face, uh, we need to make some money. And growth, does that mean just being bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, which puts off the opportunities to restructure and get some real value in? Or does it mean actual increasing the margins? And that's a big question for Sompo because we are based in Japan, listed on the Japanese Stock Exchange. We employ 80,000 people around the globe in 32 different countries. Uh, we're on Bermuda because uh, we bought Endurance uh, two and a half, three years ago. And the Sompo model is a hybrid model to use the Japanese car technology, in that if you're Japanese as an insurer, your sole and major duty of being an insurer is for your policyholders, um, and, and not so much the drive for profit. The international business is, is slightly different, um, and that is calibrated in the same way as, uh, as Western insurance companies. In terms of growth, uh, Sompo sees growth in the developing world, but also in non-insurance, but insurance-related services. So it may surprise you to learn that Sompo is the largest nursing care provider in Japan with an aging population that is a big area of business. And growth is developing services and ancillary services to run alongside insurance products. So that's where we see, see our growth. But I go back to the question, what do we mean by growth and what's the benefit of it? What are we trying to get to? Thank you. Paul. Uh, good morning. Um, pretty easy for me. I mean, our company is a new company. At the moment, we have basically zero premium. So I'm fairly certain we're going to be able to grow. Um, we are, um, yeah. we're, we're focused on uh, what I see London and Bermuda as being good at, and that's largely the specialty and complex risks. I really enjoyed Dennis's uh, uh, presentation, but I think it did pose one question, uh, the sort of parasitical or, or symbiotic relationship. Um, and there is a bit where I think clients' interests have been slightly lost in an argument between intermediaries, brokers, and carriers, where we've got to a stage where yeah, either the intermediary has to lose and the carrier do well, or the carrier lose and the intermediary do badly. I don't think it actually has to be like that. 
And if you look particularly at, I think, the reinsurance segment, you've seen plenty of examples where brokers, carriers have worked together collaboratively to actually get better outcomes for clients. And by that means, everybody is actually creating value. Thank you, Paul. Greg. Yeah, nice. Good morning. Um, we've heard a lot this morning. Um, my former colleague and Paul's current one says we're $200 billion under-reserved. Uh, Dennis is bell ringing, and there certainly is a lot of pressure at the moment on the industry. You look at three years of cat losses, two years of large man-made losses, you've got social cost inflation, you've got some level of under-reserving of the industry, and, and zero interest rates. It's not a pretty picture. So when we talk about growth, we think about an organization like ours, you are constantly have one foot on the brake and one foot on the gas. You can't just sit there and shrink to greatness. It's not a viable strategy in, in the world and certainly not at the size uh, that we're at. That doesn't mean you give up and just take everything on. You're sitting there trying to reform, correct, increase margin, as Nigel talked about, uh, on as much business as you can. In growth, for my mind, there's kind of three components of it uh, that I see. One is not all markets, not all segments of the market are in a down cycle at the moment. Some things are doing very well. Nigel touched on his in Japan. We have a few um, in some specialty lines around the world. And so you try to push those and invest in those as hard as you can. The second piece is you've got to be innovating. You have to be creating new product. I've always been very proud that at Axe XL, through two different integrations now, we've been the top of the advising pay center index for new products. You just need to keep in front of it. You need to create new revenue streams. You need to keep refreshing your products. And the third one that comes with the benefit of the acquisition by AXA is we now have access to a huge distribution network, particularly in Europe, in tied agents and small brokers that we never had access to before as, as XL Catlin. And so it's a real big boost for us for growth. Uh, we call it revenue synergies in the integration world. Uh, and we're kind of 2x what we thought we would be already 12 months into the deal. So mm -hmm. we see there's a lot of opportunity for growth. But the reality is that is fighting against a very strong demand for the need to increase margin that was talked about earlier. So there's, there's no magic bullet. And there's no, I don't see, except for someone coming from, from the beginnings, you know, a real high growth percentage rate strategy when you have an existing book. Thank you, Greg. Um, before I launch into the next question, uh, la ladies and gentlemen, may I remind you again that we, we have an app. Uh, there is a polling question for this particular panel. Please do feel free to contribute to that. And also, if you are loath to put up your hand and ask a question uh, live, um, there is an opportunity to also ask questions through the app uh, if you prefer it that way. Um, I think what's fascinating, uh, amongst other things, of, of uh, who we've got assembled on this panel is, is the different types and sizes and shapes of the organizations. Um, there's a lot uh, of discussion in the industry today about the importance of scale. Uh, we've clearly been through a period of uh, significant industry consolidation. Uh, I wondered if um, we, we might share some perspectives uh, uh, around that. Greg, uh, in reverse order, I'll perhaps start with you. Sure. Sure. Um, I think scale for us, you, you look at the world and you face kind of some big industry trends coming at you. Uh, data and analytics, uh, you look at regulatory, increasing regulatory all the time. And you look at distribution and, and Dennis's point earlier around the client and the broker and who gets paid and how. I'll stop and do a little parenthetical, which is, it's funny how we've never gotten to a point where the broker decidedly gets chosen by the client and yet the model has never shifted to the broker says to the client, and my value for this is X dollars or euros or pounds. It's always been expressed as a percentage of premium, which has always kind of bothered me about that. I completely agree with Dennis's hypothesis that the client picks the broker, but then the broker should be able to cost their value and their input. But needless to say, it's consolidating. Marsh buying JLT, the latest step of it. And I believe that scale is, the, is one of the ways that you can help lean against those forces coming against you or lean into them uh, in the case of data analytics. It makes you a bigger, stronger counterparty or partner or parasite slash symbiotic, symbiotic uh, partner to the broker. You can stand up and have bigger conversations, I believe, when you have a bigger relationship across a broader set of products and geographies. It makes you more equipped to be able to deal with the regulators and achieve solutions. And I think it definitely lets you harness data and analytics uh, better. So I don't think scale is just the answer and it conquers all. You still have to be very efficient and, and uh, uh, strong at what you do in terms of getting the right price for the product, but it helps in those big trends. And before I finish, lest my former colleague here suggests that scale is the only thing that matters, I think there will always be places for specialists that are nimble, 
good, strong uh, providers of capacity and specialist areas. I don't think that changes. I just happen to believe that the way the world is moving towards us, that being at scale helps in a, in a much bigger way. Paul, how would, uh, how would you respond to, to that? Yeah, I'm, I think Greg is right. I mean, some of the larger companies have heft in terms of relationships, and that can give you an awful lot of um, uh, a kind of ballast to your, to your strategy and keep you moving in a certain direction. You have momentum. I think where um, the challenges arise, are, as you think about what technology will provide in terms of process, Typically, those organizations are very complicated in terms of actually how they do, how they're geared up operationally. And so they have a lot of legacy problems that need solving. You're also facing a time at the moment in the marketplace where income is constrained because of recent pricing. So nobody's really making a lot of money. So actually finding the funds to actually invest in, uh, actually updating systems, getting the best systems, adopting the right technologies is... Um, is difficult, is a tough challenge. Small players have the nimbleness, the agility. We also have an opportunity to adopt um, more modern technologies and react more quickly to um, opportunities that technologies offer because you've just got a much blanker sheet of paper to be painting on. You're not having to undo uh, where you were before. In terms of data analytics, I think that's a, um, it's gonna be a really, um, big area for the industry, clearly for all industries. But as I think about it, particularly with insurance, reinsurance in mind, you can categorize it, I think, into three buckets. Distribution, so how, how does it actually inform distribution and make it easier to distribute your, your, um, your products? Operations, how do you actually make your processes leaner and more efficient and, and better? And then on insight. On the inside piece, on making better decisions, I think in lots of ways, you're, you're better as a smaller company. If you look at some of the best companies out there in terms of um, web scraping, creating uh, value from uh, public data, and essentially harnessing those things, those aren't large companies. And you can partner with those companies just as effectively as a AXA as you can as a Convex. But I think where Convex might have an advantage is the fact that you're, we're relatively small, it's a joined up team, actually getting the insights that you've derived and you've harnessed it, populated through the organization is easier. The hardest thing for big companies is actually getting that strategy and that strategic communication and the fact that when you pull a lever, something actually happens further down the line. Mm -hmm. Now that's tough <coughs> and, I've, and I've seen it done well in Excel, Catlin, I believe we'll be doing, doing done well in AXA, but it's still, it's not easy. And a company like Convex, if I say, actually, we want to do this, it tends to happen, and it tends to happen pretty immediately. Thank you, Paul. Nigel, what about consolidation, future consolidation? Is, is this something we, we're going to continue to expect to see? Yeah, so um, before coming to Bermuda and taking up this current position, um, I was and still am the head, global head of mergers and acquisitions for Sompo. And what Sompo was looking for was uh, a, a stake in the PNC market in the West. They had bought Canopius, but they wanted to expand beyond that, and, and we bought in Endurance. And the plan has always been to carry on with M&A, and we've got a, a big budget to, uh, to do so, which has been sitting around doing nothing, which has been hurting our ROE, but that's another story. And the reason why it's been sitting around and, and doing nothing is I've been asking some really hard questions of the other executives around the globe as to whether um, getting scale by mergers and acquisitions is actually the right thing to do, because I have observed, and you know, I'm supposed to be something of an expert in this, the impact of big acquisitions, and everybody talks about the synergies, and I'm very cynical. Um, I come from Yorkshire in England, we're very cynical up there. Do these synergies actually come through? And what tends to happen is you do an M&A transaction, you kick up the dust, everybody moves on, there's another story, and then gradually the bad news sort of sort of leaks out. So you've got to question scale. Um, I think there is an advantage in scale, but 
very much to um, Paul's point, it's about communication throughout the organization. Because just having a bigger GWP doesn't improve your margin unless you're doing other things within the business. Sompo is a 130-year-old business. It, it has scale. Um, and, and we are going through an efficiency drive globally. And communication is one of the biggest issues that, um, that we have. Getting a, a, a one Sompo message through is hard enough. Um, big acquisitions, um, I think, uh, have probably come to a, it, it's either at the end or it's a breathing space because of the market at the moment. Um, there's not many attractive businesses out there because there has been consolidation and that's obviously a big issue for Bermuda uh, in terms of the numbers of companies. And the pricing currently is too high. So if it's, we're talking about listed companies and the share prices are too high for the underlying businesses. And then all these businesses are going through the same volatility that we're facing with um, the exception of Convex. And I'm very envious of starting with a clean book. That must be wonderful. Um, and and, and can, you trust the, uh, can you trust the numbers? And I think we've got to search for, it's not all about scale. As I said earlier, it's about margin. But I think we've got to search for a new model where one plus one has to equal a lot more than two. You can't just rinse and repeat the same and, and then say, okay, we've got scale, so we can uptick the numbers by, because in my experience, it, it just doesn't work like that. So will there be further consolidation? I think we're seeing a breathing space. Um, plugged into the market globally, there are small deals going off here and there. The last one was Tokyo Marine spending more of its money in the States buying Pure. Um, that's more strategic. Uh, it won't make money for a long time. They know that. Um, but uh, yes, I think there will be further consolidation, but of a different type. So um, in Sompo, we are not looking at the plug and play acquisitions that everybody has done in the past. We're, we're more creative than that, looking at joint venture partnerships, strategic stakes in companies that we don't have a, a rivalry with, um, to sort of get that scale more efficient. If we could get our current company at scale more efficient, that would be better off for all the employees and all the shareholders. Thank you, and we'll come on to in international development a bit mm. later. John, have you got anything further you want to add on, uh, on scale? Yeah, or just a couple of things. You know, so I started in the, the reinsurance business in 1978, and I remember in uh, 1986, E.W. Blanche uh, hired the first actuary. It was the first broker that had an actuary. And then Guy, uh, Guy Carpenter followed suit, uh, hired Jonathan Norton, who was the first actuary at Guy Carpenter. And I'll tell you, pre that, being in reinsurance underwriter was a lot of fun because you had a knowledge advantage, right? Since then, in Dennis's point, data scientists, uh, armies of actuaries, armies of PhD modelers, where I think the knowledge, the knowledge advantage has really shifted to the to the the big intermediary, and so in any market, when you become more efficient, there's more knowledge, margins shrink, and we're seeing that in our business. And so then the pressure goes on to expenses. Well, how do we become more efficient? How do we reduce our expenses? And our business is, it's about people. How can you do more with less people? Acquisitions present that opportunity, right? And that's the, the magic synergy, whether they happen or not. I agree with Nigel, it kind of gets lost in the dust, but a lot of people lose their jobs. It happens in all industries. It happened in airlines, it happened in drug companies. But the offshoot of that is people get upset and leave. They start. Convex. They start other companies, and it starts the cycle again of new companies opening up for uh, for for acquisition. So I think, you know, acquisition uh, M and A is a broad term. Yes, it can be big, but it can be small. It can be teams of people. You know, we're in the position of being an established company, but launching new items. And so, Greg, I loved your analogy of you've got one 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 foot on a on a accelerator and one on a break because you're a big established company all over the world. You've got the good things, you have bad things. When you're new, you can really concentrate just on good things. So basically, you know, the new advantages, you can, you can have your, your foot on the pedal down. So I think uh, M&A will continue. The, the, the drive to reduce expenses is going to increase 
and that gives management good and bad, good reasons to do it and bad reasons to do it because you can camouflage things. Thank you, John. Uh, Dennis, uh, you ended uh, your session on um, a reference to technology and, and the importance of, of, of technology, certainly in uh, all of the most recent PwC global surveys of, of insurance and reinsurance companies. Te technology is seen as a, as a both an opportunity and, and a threat and, and certainly in the top three and has been for, for a few years now. Um, I know there's a huge amount of envy in the industry, Paul, at the moment about uh, your opportunity and, and starting without le legacy issues. But m maybe if I start with you, Paul, on how you're thinking about digital and technology and, and the importance of that. And if you have a wider comment on, on the industry's adoption of technology, that, that would be helpful too. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so starting with the third sort of bucket building insight, that's probably the most important thing for for complex, um, and we're going about that in a couple of ways. Firstly, you employ more people in that sector than most of your competition do. So, we're about today we're it's about 30% of the headcount are in that sector. Um, over time, it will come down to about 20%. You look across the industry; it's in the five to 10% range for carriers. Um, so, employ more people. Also think about who you can partner with and who you can work with and um, how you can actually go about building a, um, a, a means of actually ta tackling the big data question, which is uh, how do you think about public data? How do you start to harness that? How do you actually start to build value and insight from that? So get away from thinking in terms of just your structured data and thinking about it being right. Think, start thinking about uh, data as, as as being um, useful. Then you've got to start deconstructing, and I think, how the underwriting process works. You know, as an observation, you can look at a lot of the debate between underwriters and, and uh, brokers, and you see an awful lot of it is people trying to fit decisions they've made into models they've got. So, and that just strikes me as being daft, particularly when the models they've got are really, they're trying to guess severity. And guessing severity is a bit of a mug's game, really, because you tend to always find out when you have a big loss, it's a bit bigger than you thought it was, or at least it's you know, categorically different from what you thought it was. So you know, starting to, per to uh, deconstruct the underwriting process and start to think about, well, what can you actually usefully do? Start to think about where you know things and how you use things you know as opposed to things that you don't know, like... You know, how big is the next um, California earthquake going to be? I mean, that's, we've got models which, which pretend to inform us, but the chances of them not being wrong, I think everybody in the room knows, is, 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 is very small. You then need to start getting your, um, your underwriting workforce and your analytical workforce to essentially merge. So if I could, you know, if I could create an underwriter of the future, there will be a merger between somebody with a strong sales presence, so somebody who can talk to clients, somebody who can engage with their problems, somebody who can communicate when you can help them do things and if you can't, why you can't. Have that negotiation skill set because you know, whenever a broker sits down in front of you, you should be asking yourself, well, what's the stretch? How much power do I have? You know, can I actually make these terms better or am I just going to have to say, yes, thank you very much for showing me this business? Um, being clear around that, but then particularly bring the analytical uh, framework in. So if I've got an opportunity to write, yeah, there's a population of risks within this particular sector, let's say there's a thousand risks, well how do I think about ranking those, which are the best, why are they the best, who has that business, who influences that business, and how do I get access to that business should be the questions that people are asking themselves. Greg. Yeah, there's a lot in I just want to start with some combining what John said about how much fun it was when there was information asymmetry and Paul's mugs game about predicting severity, which I which I agree with. We, we've squeezed one of the biggest issues we have is we've taken out the unknown factor. We've taken out the premium that we used to charge as an industry for the uncertainty of the severity in almost every line of business, but certainly in the short tail lines as alternative capital pours it. We've beaten it all the way down to the mean plus a little something, and that doesn't get it done 
because you need, you, it, it is a fool's game to think that you're going to be perfect on predicting severity in any class of business. And we're seeing that come to fruition now with what I talked about at the top, cats, large losses, casualty, everything coming home. We've lost, and we've got to get back that uncertainty premium. So I think I, I completely agree that you put these two together and we just, that's the big drive you see right now in the marketplace in terms of the pricing dynamic. For the technology question, I'll take it in a similar but slightly different direction. For us, we call it pay to partner. The idea that as an insurance carrier, you don't want to become irrelevant uh, in Dennis's doomsday world at the end or you get disintermediated altogether. You want to stay relevant, not just by writing a check when you have a claim to your client, but by being able to provide them insights about their risk to help them manage it better, particularly when you're getting into risk sizes that the industry as an insurance industry can't cover itself. And so one quick example is trying to marry together a, num about a lot of technology that we have either invested in or become familiar with around North American construction, large construction firms. And we're right now demoing with a couple of clients a platform for them to bring to them that says, here's some wearables, here's some vehicle technology, here's some satellite imagery, here's some weather analytics, here's uh, some sensors in the, to measure smoke, heat, wet, everything. Here's a video capability to go through the site every few days and take a digital record of the whole thing so when five years you get sued because you didn't build it right, you can go back to that digital record and say, no, we actually did do it right. The, the, the risk manager today has access to each of those pieces, but they've never, he or she hasn't put it all together into a platform. So we're putting that platform together, providing that to the client, and yes, it makes us a better underwriter. It makes us able to, to do exactly what Paul described around ranking risks and, and, and uh, charging the right premium for the risk, but also gets the risk manager something that he or she didn't have before to be able to better manage their own risk. That's how we see technology coming together in this mm -hmm. pair to partner lines. John, how about you? Have you on technology from that, Scott? Yeah, I think uh, you know, the world, when you look at you know, Uber and WeWorks, it's like really dramatic. This is industry disrupting. It's going to change everything. And people are, well, that's going to happen in insurance, right? Because as, as Dennis put up that slide and all the different distribution points, taking a bite out of the apple, it, that's, that's a long way away, right? And, and what we're doing, and I think what a lot of people have come to realize is that the technology is not a disruptor, it's an enhancer. How can you use uh, the information that's available to help you be a, a better risk selector, right? When you, when you, I mean, we all can do it. Uh, there's services where you just put in the address of an insured and you know a lot about that insured, right? You can just access, and there's services that give you just incredible information insured by insured. So that enhances the underwriting process. It makes your underwriter more efficient. I think you can probably get along with fewer, fewer underwriters in the long run, but you'll still need the underwriter from an ops standpoint, accounting standpoint. These technologies are enhancers. I, I was at a thing a couple years ago, and it was a, a room full of independent agents in the United States, and I said, I mean this as a compliment. You independent agents are like cockroaches. You're impossible to kill, right? Because people think, how do we, how do we replace the independent? The independent agent is a small businessman, is a businessman in a small town. He is the insurance company. I don't know if you, you try this when you're, you know, out playing golf with people or you meet people in a small businessman, ask them, who is your insurance company? And they go, geez, I, I don't know, but Arthur's my agent. And uh, I guess Arthur's my insurance. They don't even know who the insurance company is. So that technology is going to be a total disruptor for our business. I don't see it, uh, but enhancing and making us better and more efficient, that it's already happening. Thank you. I'm going to keep things, things moving along. Um, some of you are running tr truly uh, global international businesses. N Nigel, perhaps uh, you might provide a, a wider perspective on, on international development and, and growth across the world. Yeah, so um, we're seeing a trend of, uh, well, there's been a trend of Western companies going into the developing world and pulling out now um, simply because uh, they can't make the numbers work. Um, and the problem with, as, as I've always said, the problem with the developing countries is they're always developing. They never arrive. Um, but there's money to be made there, and that's where the expansion is, and that's where it's easier to apply technology um, because you can go from zero to hero quite quickly if uh, you've got the right demographics. Um, with technology, we do have uh, digital labs, 
as everybody has. One thing I've always said, we have legacy systems in, in the business, particularly uh, in large companies, and those legacy systems are, everybody thinks it's IT. The biggest legacy, I think, is, um, is people and getting people to change. If you go to the developing world, everybody, the demographics are much younger. Um, there's a lot of well-educated people and the investment required is, is far less than, than, in the, uh, than in the West. Also, you've got to have resilient business models. So, you know, I'm in full admiration of our CEO in Turkey who can work, wake up one morning and find that the Turkish lira is halved in value. And he still makes a profit because there's a resilience. We've been there for 40 years, the same in Brazil and, and whatever. Whereas a lot of the, I say newcomers, they've been there for sort of tens of years, have never got into that resilience business model. So I think there's there's a lot um, of opportunity in the in the developing world. When you look at the numbers, they look pretty skinny. But it's for the future you've got to look, so the next five or ten years. And it's not the future that everybody focused on in, you know, Brazil is going to be absolutely fantastic, and Brazil is absolutely fantastic, then it's not absolutely fantastic. <laughs> and then you go into South America, and Argentina is fantastic, and it's, it's not that. It's actually, um, you can't go around the world as a colonialist and try and impose your own sort of systems. You've got to get under the skin and be there for the, for the long term. Um, challenges are, Obviously, in Japan, with uh, the increased longevity, all Japanese companies, not just financial services companies, have got to export their capital out of Japan because they're going to run out of customers for their products. And that's every Japanese, large Japanese company. And that was the reason for Sompo wanting to buy Canopius, which we ultimately sold, why they bought Endurance, which they ultimately sold, and that's why I'm sitting on a big M&A budget, is to get that money out of and into the West. Um, but the West poses a, a lot of challenges, as you'll find out during the day, and as, as, as we all know. Um, and I think there are potential areas of, of growth. It, it, it's amazing, I didn't travel much. Um, I'll confess that I'm, uh, I've spent many, many years not being in the insurance and PNC market, which I regard as an advantage, others, as, others may say, <laughs> say otherwise. But when you start traveling the globe and you see what's happening, you realize how parochial we are, whether um, we're in the UK, where I thought London was the center of everything, and now I take a completely different view, completely different and then the same in the US. You get out there, you'll see great opportunities. You've got to be careful, but that is where you can apply technology almost overnight um, without the legacy issues. Just, just on, on, on uh, legacy and technology, I was sitting around a number of meetings because we get a lot of clever people who are very, very clever at technology and sitting around with our very, very sort of clever executives. And it occurred to me over a period of time there was this gap. And our guys were saying, well, it's all right having these guys here, but uh, they've done nothing for us. Um, you know, when are they going to come up with some, a solution for us? And then you, you know, all the techie guys are wearing hoodies and, you know, of a different generation. And they're saying, Nigel, who are these old guys? What, what do they want? <laughs> because they knew nothing about the insurance industry. And, and closing that gap is really quite critical to getting the best out of the emerging technologies. Thank you, thank you. Um, one of the interesting um, topics we covered earlier, particularly around scale and integration and, 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 uh, and, and being able to communicate across an organization was just that. I would think we stopped slightly short of talking about corporate culture, but, but, but Paul, maybe, maybe you could uh, spend a moment or two talking about the importance of, of corporate culture in, in all of this. No, absolutely. I, mean, I think there's, um, I think, a sort of byproduct of the difficult trading uh, conditions that the uh, insurance, reinsurance markets have been through, and the amount of consolidation, is you're actually seeing um, real challenges to cultures. Yeah, it came out very loud and clear in the uh, Lloyd's cultural survey. I mean, clearly, the leadership at Lloyd's was entirely 
dissatisfied with the picture that painted. But I think that if you, you know, if you looked around through the industry, you would find an awful lot of people are under an enormous amount of stress. And all the um, uh, mental health at work, I think, is becoming an increasing issue. The industry is you know, clearly uh, uh, not diverse enough. And I think as we, as we go forwards, thinking about how we solve some of those, those issues, how we create workplaces that are compete to have the best talent and can compete with other industries to attract the best talent, that we manage those people effectively. And that doesn't mean just squeezing every last ounce of uh, intellectual juice out of them and then throwing them away at the end of it. Um, because I actually think that companies with the right culture and companies where the, um, uh, the staff are fundamentally happy, they're much more attractive to do business with yeah. because it's actually, you know, if you're about to leave a company, then how effective are you going to be in actually getting the best terms for your company you're working mm -hmm. for? You're not going to care. You're just going to go, aren't you? You just, mm -hmm. fine, whatever, I'll move on. Um, so, so building that, I think, is going to be a cornerstone of how the industry has, has to evolve. I thought it was really interesting what Nigel was saying about different cultures and doing business globally. Because I, th I think yeah, the problem is, is that it's always much more complicated than you imagine it to be from sat where you are. Mm -hmm. And so there's, a, there's, there's also an interesting dynamic, isn't there, that in most companies, particularly as they get bigger, you start to operate these things called matrix, matrix management. So you've got a kind of regional focus and a um, product focus. And I think that increasingly we're going to have to see that actually strategy needs to be regional. Mm -hmm. yeah, it needs yeah. to be, and it needs to be accounting for the cultural preferences of the staff that you're actually doing business with. Thank you. We have a, a question from uh, the audience. Uh, it, it goes, what does efficiency look like in a changing market? Sorry, what does efficiency look like in a market that is changing so rapidly against the backdrop of economic, political, and social instability? And why do companies fail with communications through change? Does anyone want to pick that one up? John? Yeah. Thanks. <coughs> you know, communication is, it's, uh, you know, it's tough when you're smaller. Uh, yeah, I've been in, involved with, with, with several startup companies, and when you're a small group of people in, in one room, Everybody knows what's going on. And then you grow and you start getting more people. And if you can keep everybody feeling like they're involved, uh, they know what's going on, that they are a true stakeholder of value to the company, you really have something special. Right? But as you get bigger, and when, I don't know what the break off size is, but most companies will say, our biggest asset, it's our people. Because right? mm -hmm. you live and die with your people. Right? That's our, our business. At some point, it's like, these people are expenses. How do we manage our expenses? And there's a change in focus, and I think communication breaks down. I think in, in, in you know, we're all, we all have vivid imaginations. Uh, when there's an unknown, you never imagine good things. You imagine bad things. It's the way we're wired. You know, we're wired to survive, so you're wired to survive by imagining bad things. I always say, when I wake up at 3 in the morning, <clears throat> I don't think about good things. I think about things that bother me, right? Um, and so I don't know what the key is or what the size is. How do you, how do you have all employees from your you know, middle level accountant to your senior accountant to your CFO to your chief, of, chief underwriter to, to your underwriter trainee feel like they are connected in the company? In today's world of technology, you can have town hall meetings, uh, you can have VC, you can I think, in general, we don't do that enough as an industry, yeah. you know, because people are so worried with their day jobs and worrying about things. So I think it's just a concerted effort to uh, to inform your employees what's going on. Yeah, I, I woke up at 4 a.m. this morning because I thought there was a lightning bolt in my bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I mispremiered it. I miss it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was in wind song, so. Um, I, I, I think just combining with. Uh, Paul and John said, to, to me, Mike McGavick taught me a lot of things. One of the things about culture was uh, the phrase that culture is what's in the air that tells you what to do when no one's in the room to tell you what to do. And so it's much deeper than the operational stuff or the, some of the lenses we've been on. It's a very, communication is a key component of it for sure. 
But to me, I think about it, it's big, big, huge things. I get asked a lot, well, how are you going to keep the XL Catlin culture going within AXA? Because they're so big and large and corporate. And I go, it actually isn't that hard because we're very flat, we're very nimble. Yes, there's a different way of operating that AXA brings to the equation. But at the very heart of it, I like to think of our people as being kind of three or four core things. Are you customer focused? Are you innovative? Are you analytical? And are you collaborative? And if you keep those things in everybody's mind and you bring the conversation back to that again, have you reached out and helped somebody else? Have you thought about this? Have you analyzed it? Have you, the way that you actually make a decision or who does what to whom when kind of falls a little bit away in the background because people feel like I'm still living the same way. I'm still, when I'm sitting at my desk making a decision about this or that, I've got those things. Am I being creative enough? Have I kept the customer in mind? Have I been analytical about it? Those persevere through whatever way you structure and execute ideas. So, I think sometimes the, the, the big clamps down and ruins everything is, a, is a, not that these guys said that, but that's the question I get quite often, is a bit of a, is a, bit of a false premise. Yeah. Just on uh, uh, communication, um, I think the, the industry is overcomplicated in terms of the messages it communicates, but most of the staff want to know whether they're doing a good job, whether they can pay their mortgage, at the end of the month, whether they've got a future. And we tend not to communicate those messages very clearly and very often. What tends to happen is even the person at reception will get an analysis of you know, what the first quarter results were or the second quarter results, and they haven't got a clue. And they worry about it, or they don't engage. And I think it's getting the, the right communication. Part of the question was uh, about efficiencies. Um, and you can only cut costs so much then you get into shrinking to a disaster. Um, <coughs> and to Paul's point, you need to have motivated people. Um, that's very important. Uh, and so whilst you've got to keep costs under control, and, and we are fortunate at some point international to have one of the lowest GA ratios. Um, and I think we could probably do more in terms of cost cutting if we chose, but we want to keep the culture, we want to keep the balance, we want to keep everybody um, sort of happy. But then when you search in the, in, in the rest of the business, there's definitely um, costs that, uh, uh, in terms of just the complexity of, of, of how we operate. I mean, if you look at our, uh, there's, there's like a spider diagram of all the different companies we operate and how they interact and whatever, and hidden in there is a huge amount of cost. And that's just legacy that's been built up over you know, tens and tens of years and acquisitions and whatever. And there are some things you can do that actually don't impact on personnel, um, but do save a lot of money. Thank you. Well, naturally, as you, as you would expect, we had a, an awful lot of ground that we, we could have covered today. We, we all uh, agreed before this that we would never get to all of it, uh, and we're not going to, I'm afraid. But um, just as a, a sort of a way to pull together what we've been, been talking about, I wonder if, if e each of you could um, to describe maybe the one or two opportunities or the one or two levers that you're looking to deploy to, to grow your businesses into, into the future. I'll, I'll start with you, John, again on, on this side. <coughs> Well, I, I think, I, as I said earlier, we're, we're in a great position of having an established uh, name in the world of Ascot. You know, very, very um, well-run, uh, great results, Lloyd Syndicate, and using that and uh, CPPIB, which is a big Canadian pension fund, to fund initiatives. And so for us, it's all about identifying the right teams of people to bring in the right segments of business and the right people to come in and start a business for us. And, uh, with the right kind of person that really resonates with them. Uh, a lot of people have been, their companies have been bought, they're now part of a much bigger company, their culture has changed, and the idea of going back to smaller, we're building, uh, is very attractive. So that's really our biggest push is in the United States, and uh, we're making a big investment there, and that's gonna be our, uh, our growth opportunity for the next you know, foreseeable future. Thank you. Nigel. I think it's uh, uh, talent is uh, is number one. Um, we want to chase and get the best people um, because that is the way um, to create an excellent business. And the other is uh, M and A in its widest sense. So partnerships, teams, plug and play. Um, so those are the two top priorities. 
or yeah so I'd, I'd echo the culture and behavior points yeah you can't beat those but yeah you know, we've got a duty to be more careful with our clients monies than we're currently doing i mean there's the industry wastes a lot of money and whether that's carriers or or brokers i don't think it you know the job of the carriers is to look after um, their expenses, the job of the brokers is to look after their expenses. But fundamentally, you know, we have to move the expenses, the operational expenses of carriers down quite significantly. Um, you know, we're challenging ourselves at Convex to essentially be best in class on that. So to have operational excellence, not cutting corners, you know, having the right facilities, having the right people, having the right abilities, but doing it at an awful lot of uh, cheaper cost. Now it's it's easier when you're starting out than when you're solving a lot of issues that you currently have, but the industry has to move uh, downwards on cost considerably. Greg? Yeah, I'll finish with what I started with, the break in the gas. Uh, on the break, be under the lever we're pulling on the hardest is be unafraid to articulate why we need that increased uh, premium because of that uncertainty factor, because that we are not being paid enough uh, for the risks that we take on. And then the foot on the gas is really leveraging both what we have within the AXA family, but broader what we've built uh, at AXA XL, uh, and be able to drive forward in innovating and creating new products and continuing to leverage that distribution angle that, that AXA gives us. So one foot in the brake, one foot in the gas. Super. John, Nigel, Paul, Greg, thank you very much for your uh, contributions today. That was thank fascinating. You. Thank you.